uh, presentation will be about uh, transportation engineering. So, uh, before we start with the presentation, again, of course, I'd like to welcome uh, our speaker who's here with us, our moderator, uh, President Sueros also here, uh, some of our board members, of course, Ma'am Praxi Bernardo is also here uh, in this webinar. So, Press Bong, uh, hey na po. Hi, Eric. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. This is uh, a very warm day for everyone and uh, here in Zoom and in Facebook Live. It's really uh, quite hot in the country as we experience high temperature uh, to as much as 51 degrees Celsius, right? So uh, don't forget to drink a lot of water. Huh? Ingat lang tayo uh, sa heat stroke and uh, lalo na dun sa COVID-19 virus. Warmest welcome my uh, colleagues in the profession also, also to our speaker, Dr. Tiglao and our panelist moderator, Dr. Sigua. On behalf of the PIC National Board of Directors, I would like to express our gratitude for being with us on this fifth day of a session of the PIC webinar lecture series, which is focused today on transportation engineering, one of the areas of specialization of civil engineering. This webinar is our, the PIC's new normal in uh, delivering additional learnings to you, our members. Though we are on health crisis brought about by the COVID-19 virus, but learning must not cease. It must continue with or without this pandemic, right? So uh, we believe that it's our personal responsibility as professionals to always learn and learn adopting any possible ways just like this, to guarantee our continuing professional development at, as what our uh, PRBECE Chair, Ma'am Praxi Bernardo said yesterday, with or without CPD units, we should continue learning. Also, this webinar is our way, is the PIC National's way of showing our sincerest appreciation for everybody's support our chapters worldwide no? to the PIC's programs and initiatives in helping our people fight this COVID-19 crisis. I would also take this opportunity to express our earnest gratitude and salute to all our civil engineers, frontliners, and also all those backliners no? or those civil engineers working hard behind the scenes. At this point, I would like to thank our resource speaker, no? Dr. No uh, Christopher Citiglau, our panelist moderator, Dr. Ricardo G. Sigua, the chair of the PIC specialty division for, uh, uh, for transportation engineering, the PIC National Board of Directors, and the lead committee of this uh, undertaking, uh, inter-specialty group committee with, of course, the six specialty divisions of PICE chaired by our uh, director, Eric Sison. Also, the student affairs committee chaired by uh, director Alvin Uy. Uh, I believe webinar lecture series also will be conducted for our student members soon. No? And our secretariat for making this webinar lecture series possible. Lastly, for everyone, as I've said four days uh, of this seminar, I would like to reiterate my wishes for you all. First, a holy, our Almighty is always first in our lives and he will surely do the rest. No? Second, a healthy, a safe and healthy life. And lastly, a happy, a happy life, always with our family and colleagues as we, um, as we hang on on this pandemic because there's always a reason for us to be happy always. Now with that, just sit down comfortably in relaxed and happy mood while having a fruitful seminar. Okay, so uh, thank you, Sir Eric. 
Thank you, Press Bong. So, yes, o nga. Matindi raw yung heat wave ngayon. So, better have a glass of water, cold water beside you habang nakikinig tayo dito sa webinar na to. So, again, also as mentioned by Sir Bong, uh, this is uh, naka-live feed po tayo sa Facebook. So, uh, just visit our uh, PI, the PICE Facebook page. It's Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, Inc. Don't forget the Inc. And then uh, please share the feed para ho mas, uh, the other members who weren't able to, to register can also watch this webinar. Uh, uh, EJ, please ano, uh, share the screen for the house rules. So before we proceed, I'd just like to again reiterate our house rules. And uh, just for information, um, the day three, the day three uh, materials will be sent to the participants in the in third day. So abangan nyo na lang po yun sa emails nyo. Uh, the day two lecture about environmental engineering uh, we're still uh, finalizing, we're still compiling the material. So medyo unahin lang po namin yung nakompleto na. So we'll be sending first the day three. So wag po kayong magtaka kung makuha nyo muna yung day three rather than day two. Then after the day three, we will be sending the presentation materials for day four. So sunod-sunod na po yun. Um, next, okay, so the house rules, I'll read as follows and explain. So again, the audio and the video for the participants will be muted for us, for the presenter not to be disturbed and for the participants to focus on the presentation. Uh, please note again that questions, relevant questions, whether it's uh, technical or admin questions, please post it on the Q&A box. Magkatabi po yung chat box at Q&A box. So please post your questions in the Q&A box para ho na mo monitor ng mga nung, uh, the panelists and the moderator yung mga questions nyo po. Yung chat box, you can chat your, uh, you can just chat whatever message you like to put, greetings and so, but questions po, dun po sa Q&A box nyo po siya i-post. Um, questions also will be entertained right after the presentation. It will be read by our moderator. Uh, we'll accommodate as many questions as we can as long as we we are ano lang we are in the time limit up to 5 pm lang po tayo so kung matapos po na maagi ang presentation then we will accommodate more questions uh, from the participants those questions that would uh, was not addressed during the presentation please email it to zoomwebinar.pic@gmail.com so that the presenter can also address your questions via email again as i mentioned this is a broadcast through our fb live page so please visit and share the live feed Poll and evaluation of the webinar must be answered by the attendees. Uh, it will be sent to you via email after the presentation. Sometimes it takes one or two days po before you namin masend because we after you fill up the evaluation form, tsaka nyo lang po may link po na lalabas to download the presentation materials of that particular day. So if you attend all the six days, you will get six emails with the evaluation. Kailangan po kasi ito sa PRC. And then fill it up. When you press up, when you click the submit, then you will get the link to download the presentation materials. The certificate will will be sent later once we have verified the evaluation form, the attendees. Then we will send out the certificates for the webinars that you have attended. Also take note that only webinars that you attended, even though you registered but did not attend, only those who attended the webinars will receive the certificate as well as the links to the poll and the materials. Um, lastly, uh, in line also with the membership campaign of PICE, we have included there the link, uh, a link in order for you to update your membership profile. So please go to there, sign up, and uh, of the, the, the evaluation form as well as certificate will also be, the, your membership profile will also be checked Pag nakapag-update po kayo, that's, that's the time we'll also send the link to you. So make sure you update the membership profile. You only have to do it once. After po magawa nyo, you don't need to sign up again. Uh, some questions that I have received yesterday, uh, I already emailed it to the Secretariat. Uh, just let's um, practice our ano lang muna, patience because uh, medyo 
skeletal po yung secretariat and we're trying to accommodate all po yung mga questions nyo. So I think the email, the, the questions yesterday regarding dun sa link po ng day one na hindi naka-receive, uh, we'll, we'll just fin we're just finishing the, so we'll just start the release of the day three materials and then we'll get back to those of you who did not receive the day one material. So babalikan po namin. So onting ano lang po, onting antay-antay lang po muna, onting pasensya lang po dahil medyo medyo skeletal po ang secretariat natin. May, na overtime na po sila sa mga ano, we did not expect actually that this would be a really big event. Okay? So that's it for the house rules and uh, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator. He is the currently the chair of the Interspecialty Group, Specialty Division in Transportation Engineering. He is also a director of the Institute of Civil Engineering, University of the Philippines, Dr. Ricardo Sigua. Um, magandang hapon sa inyo lahat or magandang umaga ano, sa ibang mga participants. Uh, uh, I learned uh, may 300 uh, participants tayo ngayon and uh, uh, there are participants coming from different parts of the world. Na? So, magandang umaga and magandang hapon. <laughs> so, well, at this point, uh, gusto ko lang na introduce ang ating um, uh, speaker um, who will be talking of, um, on a very, uh, I think, relevant uh, topic, na? Um, transportation or uh, focusing on public transport in view of the forthcoming uh, new normal. Um, siguro, um, if I may share, um, okay. Can you see this uh, slide? Okay. Yes, sir. So, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Noriel Christopher Tiglao briefly. He is uh, um, an associate professor at the National College of Public Administration and Governance at the University of the Philippines, or simply UPNCPAG. And uh, there, he's handling courses in public uh, policy analysis and spatial information management and GIS for public administration. He graduated from uh, UP for both of his uh, uh, Bachelor of Science and uh, Master of Science in Civil Engineering, um, major in Transportation Engineering. And uh, for his doctoral uh, course, he completed this in the University of uh, Tokyo. Um, he has over 20 years of uh, experience as a uh, traffic uh, modeling and transport planning uh, specialist. And he has been involved in a lot of, um, shall we call large scale uh, transportation planning projects uh, here in the country. Uh, among which are the three-year project, uh, which we call Metro Manila Urban Transportation Integration Study, or MUTIS, and then uh, the OTIS uh, survey on interregional passenger and freight flow, as well as the update uh, we had uh, for MUTIS in 2012 to 2015, which we call um, MUTIS update and capacity enhancement uh, project, or simply uh, MUSEP. He is a certified trainer of the CUBE transportation modeling software, a state-of-the-art transportation modeling suite developed by City Labs uh, of uh, USA. And uh, as far as uh, publications in journals, uh, conferences, uh, proceedings, and uh, he has published a lot uh, on focusing on integrated urban modeling and simulation, as well as sustainable public transport and choice modeling in the local context. He has been um, involved, uh, his current involvement uh, uh, focuses on researches uh, 
within um, his uh, institution. For one, um, the CHED, uh, PICARI, uh, Data Analytics for Research and Education, focusing on information exchange uh, platform for the public sector, and also uh, the University of the Philippines Energy Research Fund project on incentivizing eco-driving in the public transportation system in uh, Metro Manila. So, um, well, <clears throat> we know that um, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, COVID-19 has uh, brought about unprecedented adversities to every aspect of our society, but it also presents extraordinary opportunities for us to usher reforms in the country's public transport sector. So without much ado, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Noriel Chris, uh, Christopher Tiglau uh, to talk on rebooting public transport for the new normal, imperatives for information exchange and collaborative governance. I know uh, since you are muted, we cannot hear clapping of hands, but uh, yeah, um, please welcome uh, Dr. Tiglau. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Sigwa and uh, uh, Engineer Suero and uh, of course our uh, uh, able-bodied uh, coordinator no? uh, for the season and uh, to, the, uh, to everyone in the Board of Directors uh, as well as to all uh, uh, engineers, uh, Filipino engineers uh, uh, worldwide no? and uh, good morning and good afternoon or Good evening, uh, wherever you may be. So, uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, share the screen uh, to you uh, and discuss. And hopefully, with this sharing, uh, we are able to generate new insights uh, uh, into how we can uh, maybe uh, align our uh, initiatives and uh, our knowledge you know, in relation to public transportation and transportation engineering in general. So I'd like to share my screen. Uh, are you, uh, wait. Are you seeing it now? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can yes. see that. Okay. Okay, sige. So, yeah, it's rebooting public transport for new normal, imperatives for information exchange and collaborative governance. Uh, and uh, based on the introduction, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sigo, for that uh, very uh, uh, generous introduction. Uh, I my perspective this afternoon or yeah uh, is actually when we try to design public transport for this new normal uh, we have to take both sides of the coin no? uh, we we take the engineering perspective but also we take the administration and the uh, governance perspective uh, later on i will try to discuss why uh, dealing with uh, this field, no? uh, transportation engineering in general, but public transportation in particular has very uh, important implications, uh, not only because uh, of this pandemic, but it has, you know, ever since we have been faced with a lot of challenges in dealing with our public transport sector. And this is not only applicable for Metro Manila, but other key cities, no? uh, Cebu, Dabao, and in fact, in other cities in the world, uh, public transport remains to be a very challenging area or practice. So for the outline, uh, just to put context into the, uh, the discussion and the webinar, I'd like to run through the transport impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because we are in the short term, we're trying to reintroduce uh, uh, new tra transport services. But 
also there's a uh, there's a lot of challenges attendant to that no and we also look at how the covid-19 pandemic has uh, changed uh, mobility no uh, in metro manila and in the philippines and and then hopefully we take a step back to look at the transport system before this pandemic because uh, for many reasons uh, i will uh, mention that i think we cannot go back to the uh, old system and uh, and that and the new normal uh, will will continue to uh, to uh, to be faced by us uh, in the in the practice as well as in our daily lives and and with that i think one of the best uh, approach to address these challenges would be through what we call information exchange platform which is part of our ongoing research and then i'll try to present the way forward how do we go about this uh, you know as we usher in the new normal in public transportation so this slide presents uh, the transport uh, impacts of the covid-19 pandemic as we all know uh, the luzon uh, wide uh, uh, enhanced community quarantine no? uh, necessi necessitated the shutdown of public transportation so basically walang nakaka uh, biyahe except of course for the essential services no and uh, be, uh, because it is our hope to really flatten the curve as our uh, public health experts and uh, concerned government agencies uh, are trying to address. But at the same time, the loss of service uh, of public transport service, limited mobility options, and cost uh, essential services to be inaccessible. Uh, I think by now we have had stories, you know, of people trying to get their uh, medical attention, maybe not related to COVID-19, but they find it very difficult to access. Uh, uh, Pre-COVID-19, mahirap na nga i-access yung public transportation. All the more, it is even more difficult uh, in this time. And then we have seen, uh, and which is a good thing, uh, a good trait of Filipinos really to to be uh, you know resilient in the face of all these adversities people uh, were forced well some of them used their cars uh, but because of the, a lot of restrictions like quality checkpoints and uh, a lot of the restrictions a lot of people actually walk no? uh, walking long distances to reach uh, health facilities food suppliers banks and work locations so talagang naiba ang ating uh, mobility options no uh, and but one of the uh, uh, let's say responses of government uh, in relation to public transport that we have seen are what we call free shuttle services uh, uh, that were made available for essential uh, health workers and uh, those uh, in government. No, uh, and and to those who were uh, affected and where these shuttle services were not adequate. Uh, people cycle to work or even walk to work, no? or walk to and from uh, their places of work. So, uh, nagbago. No? Now, to look at uh, you know, how downscale the system uh, became no? in terms of public transportation, uh, we're, we're just beginning to, uh, to develop an, an analytical capability no? to, uh, to assess how these systems are addressing the current demand, but also what tools do we need to design uh, these systems pag bumalik na, no? if the ECQ will be uh, uh, relaxed uh, as we move on to GCQ and hopefully when everything is lifted. No? Now, uh, just to impress uh, upon our, uh, you know, our uh, colleagues, no? this is a, a map showing Metro Manila in general and uh, the, on the left uh, diagram shows to you the routes. No, uh, this was provided by Sakai.ph, a startup, no, for the COVID-19 free shuttle services. So if you look at it, you it may seem that all the routes are covered, no, uh, 
Uh, actually, there are uh, 97 routes covering Metro Manila, Bulacan, Cavite, and Laguna. Uh, but if you actually take a closer look, uh, you would see on the left, uh, on, on the right diagram, uh, what we call the, the uh, diagram where you have this called a heat map or areas where you actually have higher, relatively higher frequency or availability of service. So those areas that are in the dark, no, uh, darker blue areas, seems to be heavily served or relatively uh, served, uh, higher with more services. And those that are uh, paler no, uh, uh, in, in color are not served at all no, or there's less service. And the only option that you will uh, have there would be to walk or to bike. No? Now, we are trying to bring this to uh, concerned agencies because what we're seeing is that maybe we need a lot of these uh, uh, analysis to be done uh, so that as we develop new, uh, you know, uh, to a new phase in the fight against uh, the pandemic, we're able to assess uh, the adequacy of services. But it, uh, actually, I'll just also mention at this point that it even goes beyond just the simple uh, availability of routes because there are other parameters later on that you will realize that we will need to establish so that public transport system will be more resilient. No? Another uh, view of the changes in the mobility brought about by the pandemic is this is a data for, uh, provided by Google. No? Uh, every time uh, someone uh, opens up a, uh, a Google map or maybe an app, uh, it tries to record uh, your travel. No? Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, enough uh, privacy uh, protection there. So this is anonymized. So you can see here that uh, at least Google was able to establish the trend uh, along six uh, essential activities. No? Uh, this is, uh, these statistics are uh, as of May 2. Uh, and you can see there a decrease, uh, an overall decrease by 84% of retail and recreation. Because uh, these are uh, uh, going to these areas uh, are not allowed. So like restaurants, shopping centers, and so on, or theme parks where congregation and mass gathering happen. Uh, you can see there uh, at least because uh, Grocery and pharmacy uh, activities have been allowed uh, subject to certain restrictions. Then you have 53% uh, decrease uh, compared to the baseline. No? And uh, going to parks have also been restricted. Transit stations. Uh, again, this reflects the, the kind of disruption that we have um, experienced in uh, public transport where people uh, going to public transport hubs have been severely restricted. No? Uh, 80% uh, of these activities have been uh, curtailed. For workplaces, uh, we all know that there are certain uh, places uh, of work that are allowed, again, subject to these restrictions. But also, a, uh, a, uh, on, on the other hand, and this is something that I we, we should take uh, you know with a grain of salt siguro and and maybe look at our numbers as well because as we all know in any uh, crowdsourcing app you know there are sampling issues so but it records uh, at least based on the, uh, compared to the baseline 30 percent increase in residential uh, movement uh, you can actually compare this with the past uh, uh, statistics uh, because that, that is the basis of these uh, relative uh, uh, measurements. No? So all in all, uh, we're seeing really a, a big disruption in uh, mobility uh, in the Philippines no? uh, overall uh, as a result of this pandemic. Now, at this point, I'd like to uh, sort of take a step back uh, to review and assess 
before this COVID, uh, you know, uh, crisis came about, how do we uh, evaluate the public transport system uh, in Metro Manila? And maybe this is also true for all our for all other uh, key cities, uh, emerging cities in the country, you know, like Cebu and Dabao. You know? uh, number one is that road travel is highly unpredictable. No? Uh, uh, with commutes averaging from uh, maybe quarter of an hour to one hour and a half, no? uh, at least yung yung moving mo, and then you have, but it can quickly reach to about two to three hours, depending on where you are, and especially if you uh, are subject to the long waiting lines and severe congestion on EDSA, no, so uh, and. Uh, and, and again, I think uh, maybe two days ago, there was a uh, uh, an article uh, on social media then uh, that it was posted that, you know, uh, informing people that you may need to allocate two to three hours of waiting no, uh, just to get a ride on the MRT, which I think is, uh, is uh, not acceptable. No? And we have to do something about it. And uh, hopefully this uh, webinar, this uh, discussion can... Can you know we can put all our uh, our mind and efforts together, no? And uh, based on statistics, evening trips are even worse uh, than uh, morning trips. Uh, uh, maybe the the explanation would be because of staggered working hours. Uh, uh, you know, uh, then the peak uh, and the congestion during morning peak is not so. Uh, is relatively uh, less compared to the, uh, you know, and I say relatively uh, compared to the evening uh, trips, no. And uh, even right now, as we are ushering in, you know, a, you know, whether government decides to lift uh, ECQ or not, we know for a fact that the MRT uh, MRT three, no, which is uh, the main back uh, mass transit backbone in the in Metro Manila, no. Uh, which has a capacity of 380 passengers, is already have already exceeded its uh, average daily uh, capacity to about to the tune of about 560,000, so about 47 percent over capacity. So you can see the na, you can already imagine the Im the health impacts. No, uh, if we try to open this uh, er too early, or we have not the develop uh, complementary services to the MRT. And finally, uh, in terms of the mass transit system, capacity and train frequency are also marred by periodic technical failures resulting from poor maintenance uh, in the past. Now, how that will change in view of the uh, this pandemic uh, remains to be seen no? because work there has been work stoppage and we don't know uh, to what extent system will be brought up to uh, quality. No? In relation to uh, land transport naman, uh, uh, because we mentioned the rail, the land transport as well, you have irregular bus arrivals no? uh, and it's causing crowding and competition of passengers at terminals and bus stops. And as you can see, uh, maybe this is a picture of the pre-COVID. No? So the, the question really now is, what will happen no, uh, if we are to open the economy and we allow certain services to, to, to travel? No? What will happen uh, to these uh, kind of roadside conditions? No? Uh, how do we enforce uh, social distancing uh, measures in this kind of scenario? And uh, you also have irregular bus arrivals and limited route capacity, uh, which is uh, has been causing buses to operate beyond passenger capacity. So, yon uh, overloaded uh, uh, people uh, standing, no, and uh, and uh, the level of uh, service, which is the last point there, is really very poor. Uh, now, actually, uh, later on, I'll try to to define, you know. What do we mean by level service? Because this is something that we have not uh, established no, uh, in our in our local practice, at least. No, uh, uh, we we always uh, 
benchmark uh, our transportation engineering practice with that of the US no through the Institute of Transportation Engineering uh, unfortunately we don't have well established standards in the country uh, uh, not only in the uh, highway uh, sector but more seriously in the public transport uh, practice no? and uh, area of uh, expertise. The third aspect to the public transport system is with regard uh, or is in relation to the people's use of the private car. No? Uh, kasi if there are there's no uh, alternative, then people will end up buying their car. No? And uh, again, as you can see from that graphic alone, uh, you, you see there four out of five lanes on EDSA are filled not only by private cars, but also motorcycles, no? which has become an alternative to private and personal mobility. No? And uh, so the second point there, uh, which I think I want to impress on everyone, no? there is a disproportionate share of private cars on the road compared to each share, uh, you know, each share that is carrying to the overall travel demand. No? I'll, see, I'll present some uh, statistics on this uh, in the uh, coming slides. Because as you can see there, uh, it, uh, it takes up about two thirds of the entire volume. No? Uh, and this is, I think, a, a daily statistic. No? Uh, and what is uh, alarming still is that the increasing ownership and use of motorcycles has been prompted by the lack of effective public transport. So again, this is, there's now this web of issues, uh, which if you try to explain it, uh, uh, will not only require technical <coughs> uh, analysis, but also um, management and administration issues as well. No? And if you look at also in terms of the road use as an element of the uh, road environment, no? uh, the competition for road space also deter bus frequency. So, uh, and the bus now will now uh, be, be unable to meet the demand. So this is what we call yung vicious cycle. Uh, vicious cycle of people uh, because uh, of the lack of the you know, quality of public transport, they end up using their car. And be, when there are more cars on the road, then there's less space for public transport and people end up still buying uh, new cars. Or in this case that we have seen in the last maybe five to 10 years, people buying a uh, motorcycle. Now, I think that will have an impact now on the way we will reboot, try to reboot the transport system. Because uh, if people, uh, will be left to themselves without you know, government addressing the core issue of providing quality public transport, then people will be buying cars and buying motorcycles. And that will really be worse no, for everyone. This uh, slide now talks about a little bit about you know, statistics that we have uh, that describes the Metro Manila trip characteristics. No? In 2014, uh, a survey was done, uh, but the report came out in 2015. Uh, I think I mentioned, as mentioned by Dr. Sigwa, the uh, MUSEP uh, study, uh, which was uh, funded by JICA. So in 2014, uh, there's an est estimated 35 million uh, vehicle trips and 10 million uh, walking trips generated per day for Metro Manila. Uh, and uh, when I say Metro Manila, actually it's the it's the uh, it's Metro Manila and adjacent uh, provinces. Actually, you know, it's the MUSEP study area. Uh, so out of these uh, trips, uh, in terms of uh, the categories of trip makers, you may uh, look at the statistics and say that almost forty percent of these are made by service workers and laborers. So 
in relation to the pandemic, you can say that this uh, ratio or this percentage would include our essential uh, workers or health workers, about 38 to 40 percent, and those people working in in industries, no? uh, manufacturing, uh, food sector, and so on. Uh, secondly, the uh, takeaway dito is that almost a third of the trips are made by students. Uh, so students both at the elementary and secondary levels. So about 28.4%. Uh, so, so this gives you a rough figure that if you actually reboot or reopen the, the travel no, and in Metro Manila and you opt, for example, for online learning, uh, then, uh, or maybe you adjust the 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 opening of classes, then you would have reduced uh, demand by about 28.4 percent. And uh, if you are able to to scale or slowly uh, introduce trips uh, out of that 38 uh, percent of uh, service workers, then you can see maybe you can target maybe 10, 20 percent to open up uh, at least allow those uh, essential workers so you can see more or less yung what we the, the volume of travel that we are looking at from a from a demand point of view this next slide shows the supply side of things naman so for example uh, we know that there are 35 uh, motorized trips there are 10 million walking trips uh, and the question is what mode uh, what most do the, uh, the people use no uh, as far as uh, at least in terms of the the results of the MUSEP study in 2014 so uh, the, the figure uh, here uh, the graph shows that more than 70 percent of the daily travel demand is still being served by public transport so uh, so public transport has a key role in bringing people from point A to point B, from their place of residence to their place of work, place of work. Uh, and you can see more or less 70%. No? And, uh, and because you can start to analyze uh, what will happen if, you know, uh, with social distancing measures, uh, and I think IATF has now mentioned uh, fifty percent capacity uh, will be will be enforced in all public transport vehicles, meaning they can only carry fifty percent of their uh, capacity. No? So, are we seeing more? Uh, you know, definitely you will start to analyze. There will be more round trips that will be needed to carry more passengers, but without a an organized system to do this pre ECQ, uh, it was very difficult to make two round trips of a you know typical bus. How can you make that after everything is lifted? No, so there's a, a real challenge there. And um, on the uh, on the operational aspect, uh, from the point of view of the operators, strategies to address the COVID. Uh, 19 issue uh, in transportation should be accompanied by fiscal measures because we know that uh, public transport is uh, wholly uh, and entirely pro uh, provided by private uh, operators without subsidy except for fuel. So for them to make break even, then they will have to do more trips. No? Uh, and so this is a Again, a problem of how do you coordinate all these services, different objectives from the viewpoint of the operator, different objectives from the viewpoint of public health uh, agencies uh, and the companies. No? So definitely we need to come up with a, a, a coherent and systematic approach on how to do uh, analyze and develop those options. No? And in the medium uh, to the long term, we need to rethink. Uh, I, I think my, my word there is reboot, no? Uh, franchising and fair structures. Uh, because, again, 
because of a lot of these changes in the in the landscape the old franchising system will will not work and the fair structures even will will not uh, work no uh, imagine uh, companies now are being um, encouraged to to have work from home arrangements so then this will decrease actually the overall demand and and in turn decrease the uh, revenue streams of the operators so again all these challenges all these factors will come into play but we need a um, uh, we need a framework, an analytical framework on how to go about this. This uh, slide now sort of summarizes the new normal for public transportation, and this is taken from a lot, uh, you know, from uh, pronouncements by concerned agencies on how the public transportation should operate uh, once uh, ECQ is uh, lifted, no? and they are able to, and they will be given. Uh, approval to operate again. No? One is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, reduce capacity for public transport. So 50% reduction in, in ridership. And um, according to the IATF, uh, which is the interagency task force uh, to, to address the COVID uh, pandemic, 30% uh, of the population will be allowed to commute for essential work and other essential activities so actually in relation to the statistic that we presented uh, we're looking at you know uh, pre-covid we're looking at about uh, uh, 30 uh, you know 48 percent no uh, uh, sorry 38 percent 38.4 so parang it seems that it's quite uh, on the high side no medyo malaki 30 percent of the population will be allowed uh, to commute for work no and uh but again by saying this uh uh concerned government agencies were uh are also quick to come up with a sort of a uh a, a forward uh you know just a bit of a warning that we have to expect the worst no uh maybe this could mean that we, we will have less people uh uh being allowed to work uh, or, or and, and maybe I think there should be a more uh, systematic way of dealing with this. No? Uh, maybe allow it uh, on a per sector basis, and so on and so forth. No? The third one is reduced capacity for PT will force people to resort to private mode uh, and congest, but we uh, uh, to private mode or congest PT mode. So this is where I think. We should address this uh, issue uh, directly. No, uh, the reduced capacity were for for public transport will ultimately, as we have seen in the past pre-COVID, no, that people buying cars, people using motorcycle, and I think we should address all this uh, uh, squarely. No, uh, and we cannot uh, allow this to to happen. Uh, at least, maybe. Uh, uh, try to develop uh, uh, you know strategies uh, to address this and um, and there's also uh, a possibility that you know uh, some of these PT modes with low capacity might not be able to operate I mean, they might not be able to to make uh, ends meet no uh, they uh, they're not able to generate enough revenues to cover operations and so uh, in the same uh, pronouncement, uh, government is now encouraging the use of uh, uh, walking and cycling as modes. No? Uh, uh, some of uh, our um, colleagues in, in the area of transportation are saying, you know, cycling is not, should not be thought of as a, an alternative mode because in other countries, in fact, it's a major mode, no? uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, and other even other cities, no. Uh, so, but again, this the, the uh, non-motorized transport should be protected by adequate uh, road uh, infrastructure so that they can travel safely and with physical distancing. And up to this point, we have not seen a lot of 
groundwork on this. And uh, that's precisely one area where uh, a lot of uh, uh, transportation analysts in this field are trying to uh, prod government. No? Na dapat there should be more treatment, uh, more serious attention to walking and uh, cycling because the the our, our pre-COVID experience is that we have very poorly developed sidewalk, very dangerous to walk and certainly very dangerous to bike on. Uh, so we need those infrastructure. So so I think our uh, our colleagues in the other uh, specialty field, maybe, you know, we need to put uh, uh, in place certain standards on how we design uh, walking spaces, how do we design cycling spaces and so on. And uh, finally, there's a need to social, you know, for social distancing inside the PT, or the public transport system, uh, at terminals and even at stops. So how do we do this? Uh, we have, uh, apart from the requirement of one meter, in, uh, you know, spacing, uh, we have seen very limited uh, uh, guidelines on this, but. but this is where I think uh, this presentation will try to to address uh, that in part. Looking at more on the administration issues uh, and the governance issue. You know, uh, uh, before the COVID uh, pandemic, you know, uh, a lot of uh, those doing public transport analysis have been saying that there's there was there was really a need for bus reforms, no? Uh, and I put this uh, fo photo on the old lab bus system. Maybe a, a lot of you uh, have uh, experienced this, no? It was a good system to start with, but it uh, it was a government monopoly, but it was not sustained, no? But but I think it was a very good system, no? Now uh, another innovation that we're looking at would be P two P, you know, but uh, slow start, but uh, Certainly, it's a system that's meeting a certain level of demand uh, for point-to-point -point travel. But uh, still, we are faced with this system of how do you do and how do we design commutes? No? Now, this slide will, will uh, try to outline what are the considerations for, for you know, trying to think about bus reforms or, or public transport reforms in general. No? So in Metro Manila, uh, for city operation, we're looking up at around 3,170 registered bus units operated by around 228 bus companies. So from that alone, you can see that there are too many operators running the system and without a serious coordination, uh, it's, a, it's a serious coordination problem and there is no uh, adequate uh, system to manage. No? And that's why you have this very poor and low quality of service. Now, drilling down to some of the issues that we have to address, one is uh, nga, yung so, uh, serious uh, supply demand gap. Uh, the, uh, because of congestion, because of people you know, moving onto cars, using their motorcycle, then there's actually the, the statistics for for bus use and even maybe jeepney uh, has been decreasing throughout the years no so people are actually using more of the private modes and so you have this gap uh, between supply and demand and because of conge serious congestion you have decrease in daily round trips which will eat out uh, the uh, revenue stream of the operators but then of course with severe traffic congestion and you know uh, unpredictable uh, traffic, very low quality of service. No? So these are really major operational issues even before this uh, pandemic uh, came about. Now, from our vantage point in in our research uh, at the University of the Philippines, no, uh, NCPAG, we're saying that what we are what is mainly lacking here is actually an effective quality management framework uh, uh, that has contributed to the poor quality of service because we have not defined what do we mean by uh, quality of service. 
Um, and uh, just uh, some statistics there, uh, as I mentioned, it has, it has been dwindling, no? the, the public transport share. In uh, 1996, the statistics was 78, almost 80% of the uh, trips in Metro Manila actually use public transport, but it's down to 70.5% in 2012. And actually, the 2012 was the MUSEP uh, uh, first surveys. No? So it's down to 70%. Uh, so, so with this statistic in mind, it will even more, you know, be, be more reduced. You know, the demand and, you know, we don't know what will happen to the industry and maybe people will shift to more private modes. This slide will show you the, uh, the vision that we're trying to uh, present here. Uh, optimal deployment, uh, at least this is uh, our, uh, our, our dream, no? uh, vision for the bus industry uh, as a critical component to the, uh, to the public transfer system. Of course, uh, rail uh, mass transit systems will be there, but it takes a little bit of time to, to build all this infrastructure, to put uh, them in place. Meanwhile, we have uh, the, a bus, the bus industry, hopefully that can be ready to take on the, the surge uh, of demand and, and maybe which is more flexible in terms of providing those services. So, so maybe as we reboot the system, we hope to see more of this no? uh, systems put in place. One is optimal deployment of buses to improve the load factor and increase the service reliability. So in this case, we will modify this to, uh, this will have to comply with the social distancing requirements uh, of, uh, to address the COVID. No? Well-defined bus stops and pickup schedules. So ngayon, wala, there's none to speak of. Uh, uh, we are so used to uh, just waiting for the next bus. And during peak hours, bus that may never come. No? Uh, so maybe it's now time. No? As I mentioned, I, I think mentioned by Dr. Sigo earlier, not only do, does this uh, COVID-19 present serious challenges, but also unprecedented uh, opportunity. So why not introduce uh, well-defined bus stops now? Not, and I'm not talking only of Metro Manila. Uh, maybe key cities as well. No, Baka is high time uh, for Cebu, uh, for Dabao to introduce this. I think this was uh, highlighted uh, by uh, the mayor there. But again, maybe we need to put this in place now. Uh, improve bus driving behavior and professionalism so that uh, uh, there's more uh, uh, reliability and uh, there's more professionalism in the sector. Uh, just to mention, uh, the photo there is uh, Singapore, the Singapore SBST. Uh, you know, if you go to Singapore, they're, they call them bus captains. No? So bus captain ang tawag nila, they're even paid highly. Um, uh, they are even paid higher than, than uh, professionals. Uh, so that is how they are uh, giving due consideration in, in, the, uh, in increasing the professionalism of uh, the bus industry there no, in, uh, in Singapore. Then modernize bus industry practices and performance management system. So right now, uh, one of the requirement in the pandemic, I think there were guidelines issued by DOTR, that is that public transport operators, not only buses, but even jeepneys, UVs as well, that th there has to be uh, Sanitation and 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 cleaning, no uh, disinfection, uh, and how do you monitor that? That's something. So hopefully, with a performance management system in place, that can be uh, effectively enforced. And then finally, increase revenue passenger kilometers. So to address this and to achieve that, maybe we can look to uh, innovations. Uh, maybe these innovations have been established in other countries, but we have not seen this uh, locally. So uh, maybe this is where I think research will come in uh, and uh, our role as, uh, you know, uh, 
technical experts in this area. No? So one, we, we need real-time tracking of bus location and trajectory information. Uh, we need that now because we need, again, to consolidate and to integrate. Uh, we need some systematic deployment. Real-time tracking of passenger boarding and alighting. This one, I cannot stress the importance of getting real-time passenger demand data. Uh, because having been uh, you know, involved in a lot of this large-scale transportation planning for Metro Manila uh, and, uh, and other cities no, in the country, always we are, uh, there's always a dearth of information. Kung meron man, it's not really representative of what the, the nature of the trip making is uh, for a particular area. So we need new data collection platform, and one way to do this would be real-time tracking, and I'll, I'll present uh, our, our proposal for that. Then we, we need to do assessment of bus drive, drivers using insurance telematics. I'll, I'll explain this insurance telematics because this is a way to improve uh, the accountability of drivers and operators, but also trying to put a performance management system in place for bus driving. And maybe it could even be enforced uh, uh, to other modes as well. No? Improve fare collection and cost management system. Uh, I think that's critical. No? Uh, uh, right now, the, there's a move towards uh, cashless payment because of this pandemic. Uh, so we, uh, again, we need some, some uh, um, strategies there. And the last would be Harnessing uh, data analytics in enhancing bus performance. Uh, the idea is to generate insights from data, uh, which will feed into the management system. Now, to to usher this system where we use, uh, you know, uh, and these innovations, I think uh, one area uh, that we can tap is by coming up with this, what we call a framework of co-production. And this is where I think information exchange in public transport will come in. Uh, because uh, the, the point here is that, you know, uh, in trying to design a system, uh, whether it's the built environment, uh, for public transport, I think we cannot leave it to maybe one or two analysts or maybe engineer to do it. We, uh, my, my view is that we need all the stakeholders together to present solutions and for us to agree uh, in a more collaborative fashion. So this uh, framework is something that we, are, we have been proposing to various stakeholders at, the, at the, the city level and even at the national level. What we're trying to say is that we need to engage the community so that we're able to to find the sustainable strategies. But at the same time, we also provide data, data that can be shared openly so that it supports this uh, process. Uh, this process uh, requires um, six steps, uh, which is called design thinking there in the, at the center. So the first step requires us that, uh, requires that we should understand uh, the factors, understand data, understand the, the objectives. And then we try to define what the solution will be uh, or maybe some alternatives. And then there's a point where we diverge. So it's actually okay for us to have divergent views on what the solution, and I think this should happen no? uh, right now. No? Uh, ad otherwise, if we don't do this, then if it's one sector trying to present its own solution, it's only addressing its own perspective and interest. No? And, uh, and then we go to a phase of deciding and then prototyping. So in design thinking, this is very important. No? Na it, it may not be a, um, a system that you can get Perf, uh, you know, uh, in a, in a perfectly in one go. So you you need to prototype, and then you need to validate. In other uh, 
in Singapore, uh, when uh, they were doing reforms for their bus system, they had what we call a sandbox program. So, and in that sandbox program, the idea is let the system operate, but you get the data and you assess it at the end of that program for you now to be able to finalize uh, the policy and the uh, technical requirements of the solution. No? And then finally, you go into a phase of collaborative design. Now, one, uh, I think major loaded yung concept na yan, no? uh, co-production, but in a nutshell, uh, what we're trying to say is bring people uh, to the table to think about solutions. And what we have done here is we, we try to uh, uh, work this out with an LGU. In this case, this is, you can see the PASIG bus. So for PASIG uh, bus, we're trying to work with the local government so that uh, they're able to set up or put in place a, a kind of a performance-based management system. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, PASIG city is the first a local government to introduce its own local government run bus or what we call a mini bus system. And so it's called actually a shuttle. So it just operates within the city and maybe connect to uh, the CBD no, uh, in Ortigas. So, so we're trying to, to test this concept. Uh, and one way to look at this would be to also uh, use telematics. You know, the idea is to monitor to to do real time tracking of uh, buses and passengers and drivers and so on and so forth which we have not done really because uh, right now this is a metro manila it's only the operators who have access to the data no uh, uh, we, uh, they don't even have data on where the passengers are at specific points in time no and um and the third point that we're trying to raise here is we need sustained engagement and partnership uh, with the bus operator because we need them to think about new business models. Uh, so the idea is uh, for the regulator and the industry provide actors to, to work hand in hand to come up with a, a performance-based management system. And one way to define public, you know, that performance-based management system is to define what do we mean by public transport quality of service. So we did a pilot survey uh, uh, for actually this uh, is survey done uh, uh, with the, the respondents are students from UP Diliman, and we we asked them, uh, you know, how do you define quality of service? Uh, and uh, you can see that you know uh, the students in uh, our youth Diliman are they're actually a microcosm of the society. You know? So, so with with the, a survey, we asked them and they defined actually about seven factors that will define quality of service. Number one has something to do with vehicle condition. So, if the vehicle is uh, it is good seating condition, there is ease of entry, and uh, and emission levels are low, then that would be one. Then there's a factor on comfort, and comfort has something to do with safety, uh, ease in payment, no, uh, and the drivers being respectable and the driver skills, no. So that's uh, 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 you know a factor uh, related to comfort. The third one has something to do with service adequacy. So is it available during the night time? You know, uh, short waiting time. So. It's not only the bus, but you know the time that you spend at the stops, no adequate bayon, no. Then you also have accessibility. So the accessibility has something to do with the stops. No, we, we uh, where do you get on and off in the network? So accessibility is very important. The fifth factor has something to do with information. Do you have enough information so that when you make a travel, you can get that information? Uh, and route information is available or even operator information is available. Uh, the last two has something to do with the uh, availability uh, for special events, no? uh, available during weekday uh, or, uh, or uh, certain uh, uh, daytime uh, periods. And then finally, connectivity. 
connectivity uh, has something to do with how well the the bus that you're trying to get on is connected with the rest of the network. So as you can see here, with this uh, pilot survey alone, for us to define quality of service for public transport, we need at least seven factors. Uh, and, uh, and the next stage here maybe is to introduce this and then rate, we need to rate uh, our systems no? in terms of vehicle condition, comfort, adequacy, accessibility, information availability, and connectivity, and route availability. No? So this is uh, an ongoing research, but hopefully what we're trying to present here is that we, we should monitor, we should measure, we should, it should become part of the performance management system. Now, the next slide will present to you, okay, you may ask, okay, if you're able to measure that, establish that for a particular system or operator, then what's next? Now, the next stage will really be, the, the challenge is how do you bring incentives or disincentives to the operator so that they actually will behave uh, and will comply to higher levels of quality of service. And this is a sort of ang tawag dito is a pipeline no? where in that uh, pipeline you see bus and driver data. So if you have bus and driver data and we install the telematics device, but you can quickly do that with, uh, with an app, which I will show you very quickly. You capture real time uh, you know, uh, data, you aggregate that data, and then you come up with a risk assessment. So this system will, you can read more about this, no? and maybe uh, those, uh, maybe other, other engineers who are working abroad, you, you may be, uh, this is not only applicable to bus and public transport, this could also be uh, applicable to private vehicle use, uh, in, in fact, in the US or in, uh, in the UK and uh, Europe, no? where you have sort of pay as you drive schemes for for your insurance no so ang idea dito is that if you are able to uh, assess the risk almost real time then there's a feedback system to say that hey bus driver bus operator you are falling below certain quality of service and so this will have a an impact on your revenue stream and you will get some disincentives on this so it becomes now an economic uh, system uh, where, whereby the operators now will have to adhere and will have to, to be part. You know? So I think uh, for this slide, it's very important that data that you, we capture on board are aggregated and forms part of a performance management system and on the part of the driver and the operator, there's a risk, a measurement. And hopefully this will feed into a kind of an insurance system. Now, this is I think the core of the discussion and the presentation. To reboot the uh, public transport system with all the factors that I've mentioned uh, pre-COVID and now because of you know the, the need to to address the pandemic and issues and guidelines, and as well as the business issues are surrounding the industry, we need now an information exchange platform so that strategies can be identified in a collaborative way. Uh, as I mentioned, design thinking and uh, collaborative governance is key. No? And I, I can mention four of these uh, imperatives. One is that we need to establish a reliable transport planning database now. Uh, all the data that we have so far before the pandemic, I think is already uh, uh, has failed you know, in terms of relevance because uh, we are now moving into the new normal. So people will, will shift somewhere, maybe shift their workplace, maybe shift their mode that they will use and so on and so forth, depending on, on guidelines that will be issued later on. 
Second one is that we need to address a complex public policy issue. Uh, so, uh, and when I say complex public policy issues, you have multi-stakeholder, meaning you, you're talking here of government, operators, drivers, uh, commuters, and other concerned uh, uh, parties, and multi-objective. Uh, to the, maybe to the, uh, and I mentioned also private sector, no? Private sector, the, the employers, no? So the, to the employer, they want maybe to bring all their employees back to the office, maybe. That, that's what their objective. But that couldn't be done readily because of limitations, no? Uh, limitations of the public transport system, and and maybe uh, work from home uh, arrangement. So there are a lot of these objectives uh, at play, different stakeholders. So we need to come up with an information exchange platform. Third, uh, need uh, there's a need to involve all stakeholders in the design, implementation, and monitoring of the public transport system because it's a very risky area uh, field. Uh, uh, people congregate uh, in uh, at the stops and inside vehicles. So, without proper enforcement, we will have uh, you know public health scientists are now mentioning of a second or third wave. No, so we uh, I think we have to address that as well. Uh, so the framework here is to pursue a design thinking and collaborative governance approach where people actually try to present solutions and the solution here. Uh, the solution for Metro Manila may be different from Cebu, from Dabao, from island provinces. Yan, no? So the idea is to bring people together to, to solve. Uh, uh, I will not go to the details of other modes like tricycle and so on and so forth because there's a, a lot of uh, issues there. But what I would say here is that our, our best chance of uh, address or promoting a strat workable strategy would be through design thinking and collaborative governance. And then finally, uh, harness the power of information technology and data analytics, so crowdsourcing. Uh, so if people, uh, the various stakeholders, contribute to the data, then we would have uh, ridership data or demand data coming from the commuters. We would have supply data from the operators. And we would have, and then government can actually look at maybe uh, be, will be more efficient in enforcing some of these uh, guidelines. No? The next slide is a is a I think a theoretical uh, discussion on how we uh, tap into the power of the crowd no? through crowdsourcing. So you see four uh, three circles there. Uh, one is you have the crowd. So the crowd would have a role as a sensor. So it's a social sensor. They go out to the field, they do some reporting. Uh, they are also uh, social computers that they can assess. This system is not working, this system, system should be working and so on and so forth. So yung, when we when government comes up with, you know, be prepared to a two to three hour waiting, I think there has to be a better way. Right? So uh, people can, can, can be given that, um, that uh, ability you know, to uh, propose solution. Then you have online tools uh, for data collection, filtering, tagging, and so on. And then uh, geospatial intelligence. Uh, so for data analytics, uh, that will analyze, harness all this data. I will quickly go to the series of slides uh, in the interest of, you know, maybe people would have uh, questions already, you know, but. Uh, what we have done so far at the start of this uh, uh, pandemic is uh, we uh, we have developed a platform uh, uh, we call Safe Travel PH, uh, uh, an information exchange platform where it's actually a real-time uh, platform where you have operator databases there on the top left. Uh, if you're able to come up with with fixed schedule, fixed timetables, fixed routes, fixed stops. Hopefully that, that would be one element. No? And then uh, at the bottom database there, you have passenger database. So if people can actually contribute uh, you know, their trip making, uh, so it's just a, a very simple system of capturing your origin, your intended destination as well. And then you have an analytics database that tries to 
to uh, address and pro uh, and provide information where needed. For example, the bus operator might need to know where the passengers are, or, or it might inform uh, the government that hey, there uh, you know queue is building up. Provide uh, additional buses or other tra public transport, and then it will also inform the passenger on oncoming or arriving uh, services. And then everything will now be processed and then it will be presented in, in maps that can be actionable. Uh, we, we developed this uh, at the National uh, College of Public Administration and Governance, and it's actually part of the pandemic response team uh, spearheaded by the by UP uh, Resilience Institute. So we're, we're, uh, we're also trying to provide this as a way uh, to monitor public transport uh, in this overall effort to address the pandemic. Uh, so just quickly onto the feature. So you, you uh, log in so uh, to to do away with a lot of you know privacy issues, there's only four information that's needed. Uh, well, actually five. No, so just the first name, last name, uh, age, uh, and username and password, and that's it. So there's no attribution to your place uh, or work or even contact information because the the contact the point of contact will be the app. No, uh, so it doesn't take any uh, additional information from you. There's a reporting module uh, in this app where you can actually report incidents, uh, maybe you can report a certain uh, 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 reports on what is happening in public transport in your area. Uh, maybe you can link this to social media for, for uh, sharing. And uh, the good thing about this is that this geotag reports can be mined later on for insights. Uh, a major functionality would be trip tracking. So, so it's just a simple step of turning on the app, click start tracking, and then you just mention your origin and destination. And there's this uh, functionality that you can scan at the QR code of a vehicle so that it pairs with your trip. So it means that you are actually on that trip. No? So it's a way to monitor uh, uh, occupancy. And hopefully, it can also be a way to uh, monitor the quality of service uh, and uh, as a validation that you actually did uh, made that trip for that uh, particular bus. Fleet tracking, it does, uh, in one app, uh, it can also uh, uh, monitor the operator the, or the conductor, as the case may be. So in this case, the conductor will trans, uh, transmit real-time boarding and lighting. So here we can get the demand counts and uh, actual vehicle position as well. And uh, this is done in real time. So, so it's a very, I think uh, it's a very basic functionality, but I think something that can be used readily, no? uh, that can monitor, uh, that can scale as we introduce or reintroduce public transport. So uh, apart from this, there are uh, uh, public health uh, benefits, I think, in, in this app. One is, uh, apart from the reporting on the checkpoints or the roadside, uh, we can maintain uh, and monitor public transport uh, occupancy limits. Uh, uh, we avoid overcrowding at transit stops because if we have GPS location of people using or where they are at the stops, then we, would, we can quickly address uh the those issues and uh, the fourth one um actually this app is being reviewed by doh uh, we uh, we are seeking approval because it could also be a way to assist in contract tracing so remember that you can you can pair uh, a particular passenger can pair with the vehicle so you would know that this particular person actually boarded that vehicle at this specific point in time uh, on this route, no. So, so if there are any uh, you know public health issues, then uh, it can help uh, and assist in contact tracing. And then finally, public health advisory to passengers and transport operators. 
uh, the app can you know uh, can be uh, expanded to have some form of notification. Okay, so I think down to the uh, last uh, two slides here uh, to summarize. So far, uh, I think uh, we definitely have COVID issue. So prevention of disease transmission in bus transportation by by way of reducing, you know, uh, congregation by way of uh, providing more. Uh, uh, available service, uh, lesser travel time or lesser waiting time. Uh, we are proposing a gradual or phased restart, uh, not to allow everything all at once because that's a sure formula for uh, you know for lack of uh, uh, systematic approach. Maintain social distancing within the bus transfer system. Then you can really do that by uh, monitoring occupancy limits. Manage travel demand for both essential and non-essential trips. Uh, I think that's. That has something to do with the overall demand that we will need to serve. And so there has to be a phased implementation as well. Uh, establish a concrete communication strategy for public transport users. So again, a design thinking collaborative governance approach will make this communication more, uh, will, will support this kind of communi uh, positive communication among the stakeholders. And then finally, monitoring and replanning for for the long term. So for the way forward, uh, and by way of a sort of a summary, uh, uh, my recommendation here is that the government must fast track the reorganization of uh, all PUB operators uh, into a consortium. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, 3, 000, more than 3,000 buses run by 200 operators. Now how can you uh, work with that system, no? And so we are uh, on the lookout for new institutional models, cooperative business models, no? and information that we can get through an information exchange platform can help rationalize actions by, by government here. And of course, also convince stakeholders. And uh, we need a coordinated and open fleet management program that can increase the availability of bus units on the road. And I think a crowdsourcing platform like Safe Travel PH app can, can help in that area to improve uh, reliability. An issue that we mentioned on car dependence, so it should be mitigated immediately uh, by implementing car use restrictions, uh, uh, such as congestion pricing or car free hours. Again, uh, my view here is that there should be gr greater bias uh, for public transport uh, and, of course, allowing for safe travel uh, by other modes, but in particular non-motorized transport, such as walking and cycling, will become a, a new norm. And then finally, uh, establish a, an information exchange platform where we involve government, public transport operators, and users which can aid planning, implementing, and monitoring of public services. Um, as a final note here, I would say that um, our best chance to, to come up with sustainable strategies is actually if people, as stakeholders, uh, work in a co-production mode, no? uh, meaning ideas should not come from the top down. Uh, and by any means should not also be coming from the bottom up. But I think it's, it's both uh, government, you know, trying to present something and stakeholders also trying to, to work out some sustainable strategies from the ground. And the idea here is there should be a, an iteration. So, but, and I think design thinking will address that. So with this, I'd like to, to end. Uh, and I thank you for your... Uh, uh, attention uh, and hope that you, we can have some fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's 4.30. 4.30 and we have uh, exactly 30 minutes uh, to uh, to have this question and answer uh, portion. 
Um, can um, um, can you uh, unshare the screen, uh, Noria? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of uh, comments, questions, uh, both uh, related to the topic and uh, not related. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I wonder if we could uh, tackle both no, as uh, a range. I'll be looking at the technical aspect of it, meaning those questions which are related to the presentation of Dr. Tiglau and uh, uh, Sir Eric uh, uh, will look at the questions pertaining to uh, administrative matters, yeah. no? but uh, maybe we should start with the technical uh, aspect first. Is that okay, uh, Eric? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so, sir. Papa. Just uh, yeah. discuss po yan, and then ako na po later dun sa announcement sa lang po yung sa admin. Okay, thank you. So there are indeed several interesting questions <laughs> mm -hmm. if we look at the q and a but uh, i'm not sure if we will be able to tackle this but first is uh, coming from uh, engineer sani andalin question is can dotr introduce a fleet management system for both puj and bus in metro manila i think this part of uh, also you mentioned this in the way forward but uh, uh, What's your yeah. reaction on this? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, that has been uh, uh, proposed no, uh, to the OTR, and they have had a lot of studies, uh, technical studies on that. But I think the uh, the the framework by which the OTR is doing that is actually give it to a uh, maybe you know supplier no. Uh, Parang is a very centralized system, uh, and uh, we d we will not have any control on, for example, technology or or any framework. No, but my my uh, my framework there is that what I'm trying to propose here is a, is a fleet management system that is open. It's crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. uh, people will want to give uh, their data. Will want to to promote, uh, will want to contribute to the data because they know that if they go into this, then it will improve the service. So th th this is the, the framework by which I am proposing. No? It's a collaborative governance. And, uh, and, and I think uh, observing from my, you know, my uh, experience uh, with the OTR, uh, well, in, even in the past, no, the OTC, uh, it's a very complex system. No, uh, mm -hmm. now I think at this point, because we want the solution to be to be long lasting, to be you know as we transition and it could be very dynamic from here on. The solution could come from from different people, from different stakeholders. So multi-stakeholder approach. Codito. It's not. Uh, of course, there are technical issues, but the 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 limitation of Technical issues that are drawn uh, by maybe a uh, a group. That's one group. We it will so, sort of drown some of the potential solutions from other groups. For example, we we're not hearing a lot from from uh, cyclists. For example, mm -hmm. uh, we're not hearing a lot from from LGUs. For example, so very top down parene is the OTR uh, providing that. So okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I hope that uh, answers the question of uh, Engineer Sani. Another question comes from uh, Christina Amor uh, Rosales. The question is, is there a correlation between the decline of usage of public transport and cheaper cost of availing private cars? Yes, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I think. Yo, ma ma uh, and um, surely there's a correlation there. Uh, and the danger is that we don't know uh, to what extent, you know, uh, with, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to scare, but, you know, uh, public transport is a very susceptible uh, sector, no? Mm -hmm. To what extent people will start buying their car 
start buying a motorcycle because they don't want to be in the crowd. So mm -hmm. yun ang ano ko eh, and uh, and government should have a strong message uh, with that, and that's why I say there has to be car uh, you know a policy that will will uh, hopefully force people out of their car. Uh, again, that's just something. It's a very loaded uh, proposal, but uh, but without a a system in place, uh, we cannot do that. And when I'm saying transport as well, I did not mention this in the pr uh, presentation, but because solution could not only come from the transport perspective, but there is a land use. No? So mm -hmm. why do you buy a car? Because you live far and there's no adequate uh, transportation. Just yesterday, I was in a talk with the Management Association of the Philippines, uh, their transport committee head. So I uh, maybe we should rethink, uh, you know, the employers should rethink uh, because this is actually a, uh, a point that was raised by my um, advisor no? uh, when I was doing uh, graduate work. Tanong niya, why are employers in the Philippines not providing employee housing? Because mm -hmm. employee housing will will reduce uh, travel demand. And uh, I got a nod from actually from the, the MAP representative. Sabi niya, oh nga, no? bakit hindi natin tingnan yan? No? Uh, because it will work to their advantage if people live close to work and that's maybe and maybe on the weekend dun lang sila they can go back to their place of residence or or maybe other uh other accommodations no so yeah that's that's my answer there's a correlation mm -hmm. we need to address it okay thank you um eric uh will 10 minutes be okay for you for the admin part Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are, of course, comments, uh, suggestions, and of course, uh, questions. One um, uh, suggestion uh, came from uh, Engineer Vic, uh, the third Bernardino, no? and uh, he is suggesting maybe we can adopt the bus system here in Singapore. I would assume that uh, he is based in Singapore. No? Mm. Uh, there's a related question uh, coming from uh, engineer Eduardo Vitug Francisco. Uh, it, it, uh, question is, is there a plan to reintroduce the double deck buses in Metro Manila to double the capacity? Yeah, very good, very good uh, points. Uh, uh, yeah, your Singapore model is loaded uh, as the model for bus contracting, yung tinatawag nila na bus contracting model, they, for them to arrive at that model, it took them six years. And six years of partnership talks between government and the operators. And the, uh, they call them yung mga housing um, uh, townships. So, a lot of effort there. no? So, I, I think I'm all for that. And regarding the second, uh, the double-decker buses, I have not heard uh, of any discussion on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But maybe it's a good, it's good. Okay. Uh, question coming from Engineer Albert Ferdinand Carrion. Do you think the BRT or the bus rapid transit system can be an effective mode of transportation for Metro Manila? And can it also be an effective transport mode during the new normal? A very good question uh, and certainly very difficult. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, Just but just to inform, uh, maybe just to be on the transparent side, I think DOTR uh, is now trying to roll out a BRT concept uh, for EDSA in particular. No, so they call it the EDSA plan. But uh, my, my uh, again, there is a lot of uh, technical issues there. What to do at intersections? Uh, you know, how do you deal with the multiple operators? Uh, I think um, the the missing gap there is really the information, and mm -hmm. uh, and I have not seen the level of discussion that you know for the operators to open up and the commuters also to open up likewise and government also. So. Uh, uh, not to say that yung design team, uh, because the way these things are designed, uh, and maybe a, a lot of our uh, engineers uh, are so they are are uh, you know we do our designs as a team, no? 
but ang my my, my concept here is that maybe the, the the final design should not come from a design team that uh, you know that has been formed maybe a seven, five man person or a seven man and woman person trying to come up i think it should involve everyone no uh and, and that's why I, I in one of the um, the slide i showed uh for example in pasig maybe part of the puzzle would be why not allow cities to introduce a kind of a city bus that will link up to a broader BRT concept. No? Uh, kasi right now, it's just the singular line and what do you do to uh, to reach those endpoints? No? So, uh, I think we, have, we need to have our own brand of BRT uh, and uh, we need details, uh, surely. We need sort of a phased implementation but we can maybe we can also work with existing uh operators and try to organize them because the the good thing is that maybe th there's a uh, imperative ngayon eh, for them to work together uh, uh and maybe if uh uh you know in singapore they always say that it was easy in the transition because they only had one or two and the major one was sbst so, madali lang. And now, because of the bus contracting, they're looking at contracting it to about maximum of five uh, operators per area. So, medyo iba ang problem natin. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Engineer Ronald Victoria, uh, how could the government cater most of the commuters which may not be able to ride the MRT? It's a very tough question. <laughs> yeah, tough question, tough question. No. Yeah. Ang, ang short answer ko dyan is that we need more information about those, you know, the difficulty of getting those rides kasi uh, is, uh, we need a, uh, we need those perspectives. Eh? Uh, e even the Magna Carta for uh, PWDs, no? uh, we have, government has not even provided ample uh or has not monitored really the adherence to to uh, facilities for PWD. So and that has been long long standing. So uh, the information exchange platform can can uh, can address that, and uh, it's time to to get those you know information uh, from the commuters. Okay, from uh, engineer Villamor Abad Jr. One of the modes of transmission of COVID-19, as uh, reported in various news, is the money bills. No? Is mm -hmm. there a way that we can reform the mode of payment to all public transport to card payment, for instance, like the beep? Uh, he thinks that this is one of the things uh, that would need serious consideration at present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, very good uh, observation. Uh, in fact, uh, those uh, uh, that is one of the guidelines issued by IATF and even DOTR on the move towards uh, cashless uh, payment. But I think also uh, added to that, a cashless mode could could even be in the form of uh, 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 fair subsidies to employees. Uh, actually, I took this up again with the map. Uh, uh, you know, committee member yesterday, sabi ko, you know, if uh, the employer is uh, uh, so concerned, no, that their employees get to the workplace uh, easily, you know, or in, in a safe manner, maybe there would be, it would be to their interest to provide those subsidies and uh, provide incentives. Mm -hmm. So, baka pwedeng, you know, do na. No payment, but they can monitor. So, again, these are... We, we can we can we can design think all these uh, uh, solutions and strategies. Okay. From engineer Jeruwen Mercado. No? Before the pandemic began, we already have public transport problems like lack of it and of course traffic congestion. Is Metro Manila ready for GCQ considering the new normal? I think we have seen. Uh, some news, uh, well, at least last night and the other night uh, when uh, um, 
say Cagayan de Oro and Cotabato no um uh, naging GCQ na but uh, we see na talagang parang balik sa old normal eh no <laughs> 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 dahil correct, correct. siguro sa wala <laughs> sa kulang ng plano no mm, and, uh, correct correct so what about Metro Manila no uh, I, I, mm. yeah correct so th- that's really the concern and uh uh, and uh, actually, I welcome this uh, opportunity uh, with Pais, no, to to be able to bring this up. Uh, maybe in our own spheres of influence, we can bring that to uh, concerned uh, entities. Uh, our, our best chance we have seen in Europe, na yung walking and uh, cycling uh, infrastructure is gaining ground, no. Dito sa atin, we have not seen. We're, we're not even building a single. Uh, we're not even widening <laughs> a single sidewalk, no. So. Uh, uh, I think we're we're not ready at, at, uh, still, no. Uh, that's why mm. I think we're going to meeting tomorrow. Uh, and the the thing is, how do you monitor, no, uh, in Metro Manila? Mm. Okay, uh, from engineer Job Joby Aldaba, huh? can we use the LGU to have a standard development plan for all bus terminals adapting the new? normal maybe uh, i would add one thing here no? uh, since uh, the otr has asked all lgus not to develop their lptrp you know and uh, and most of the lgus have submitted no? uh, their plans to the otr for um, assessment um, and asking for approval no? so um what do you think uh, would happen to this LPTRP and uh, to the question of um, Engineer Aldaba? No? Can we use the LGU no? to have standard development plan for, in this case, uh, bus terminal yung uh, I mentioned? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think so. I think so because uh, they actually accredit, uh, they even tax uh, you know, this terminal. So I think uh, it's in their purview to maintain uh, uh those standards so yes uh, i would uh, think that you know to address the pandemic and, and even beyond a uh, greater responsibility should put uh, should be put on the uh, local governments to maintain uh, mm-hmm. guideline the strict adherence to guidelines okay uh. <laughs> there are a lot of questions but, okay 448 from engineer ruel ramos no how can we help decongest our roads if we decrease public transport capacity? Does this mean that the turnaround time of public transport will be increased or possibly doubled? Yes, actually that's the, that's the thing. Uh, either you, you increase the stock, uh, the, the suggestion on double-decker would be in that order. Uh, but also the idea is proper separation and, and arrival and departure of buses so that mm. they're able to bring in, in passengers quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's almost 4.50. So, um, well... Siguro, uh, 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 last, uh, can you just check? Siguro mga two questions alam po. Okay, yes. Uh, from... Engineer Luisito Carlos, um, what would be the considerations or implications of this new norm in public transport after COVID in terms of infrastructure landscape? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yung nga, hopefully, it's still taking shape. Uh, I hope we need, we can see more adequate uh, walking and cycling infra. Oh, wala tayo eh, no? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and even just to introduce formal transit stops and at and fixed timetable we have not seen that as well and uh, other modes as i hinted by dotrs uh, in the at least in the interim baka they might not be able to operate because it's very difficult to to maintain uh, social distancing okay thank you last question maybe you know, from engineer fredel de vera Time is of the essence, and we need to come up with solutions to public transport after the pandemic. What do you suggest on how to gather the transport agencies, 
the government, the stakeholders, mm, to get together and table solutions. What high-level risks should they be considering first? And how much time we need to prepare? So, well, many many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so first, maybe, uh, what do you suggest on how to gather uh, the different uh, transport agencies and other stakeholders? To, yeah, to, uh, to come to a yeah, to a solution. Hmm. I think yung uh, in one slide you might be interested to look at design thinking uh, approach. Yung design thinking approach kasi is a very is a structured way. It's not uh, to get actually quick uh, collaborative uh, solutions. Uh, we have tested mm -hmm. it on several location. It might be good to test that here. No, uh, different people uh, working uh, on the solution and then using that process of design thinking. Okay. And what high-level risks should they be considering first? Uh, well, I, I think ngayon, it's really the, I think the main consideration is uh, financial resources. No, I, How do you, uh, again, multi-objective problem ito. Uh, the operators would want subsidy, uh, mm -hmm. but with reduced demand, uh, you cannot increase the fare. Uh, and there's increasing pressure now because of uh, uh, lack of public transport. People might need might end up buying a car and then worsening everything. So th that's why I, I think uh, there's a, there's a correct way of rebooting uh, mm. re rebooting everything. So, but I think uh, should start with a, a design thinking muna, uh, just to get the the ideas off the ground. And then may may uh, may uh, facing. Okay, mm. thank you. Last question. Uh, well, uh, maybe I think uh, this is another question for from Engineer Aldaba. How can this vision for bus industry? I think uh, based on your presentation, uh, how can this vision for bus industry be implemented? so that the research effort of the civil engineers will not be wasted. Yes, actually, it's really about uh, uh, achieving partnerships. Eh. Uh, ang, ang tawag dyan, uh, you, might be you might want to look at the literature in Singapore again and uh, Australia on trusting partnership. So mm -hmm. actually, sa kanila, it, it took time, um, maybe 10 to 20 years, to come up with trusting partnership. So... Uh, but you uh, know, we're, we're uh, at least in the academe and uh, in our uh, field of practice, we're trying to bring people to talk uh, and 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 uh, identify the solutions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tiglao. Let's <laughs> give a hand of applause <laughs> to Dr. Much, Tiglao yeah. once again. Thank you. Okay, I'll now give the floor to. Um, our chair, uh, Eric Sison. All right, thank you again, Sir Ano, Sir Noriel. Very, very interesting yung topic nyo. And wala, I mean, even before the pandemic, challenge na talaga yung transportation natin. Be, what more nga, feeling ko, we can't really give a 100% sure na answer dun sa mga questions. Eh. <laughs> but very, ano po, very interesting. And I think marami pong na tickle yung minds ng ating mga participants and hopefully we can do something about our situation now. So thank you po ulit, Dr. Tiglao, uh, for your time. Thank you rin po, Dr. Rick Sigua, for moderating this uh, webinar. Uh, very good attendance po ulit tayo. Mabot po tayo ng about 350 participants and I think thousands po yung nag-view din dun sa FB Live. Wala lang po ako exact numbers but I think we have more than a thousand who are viewing our FB Live feed. Uh, very positive feedback pa rin po sa mga members natin. Uh, very informative po yung topic. And nagpi thank you po sila to our speaker. Okay. Um, just a few announcements uh, before we close our webinar today. You can, all your questions that were not answered, you can email it to zoomwebinars.pice at gmail.com and we will forward it to our speaker. So those questions can be answered via email lang alam po. Uh, 
with regards to dun sa evaluation form, we have we are emailing now the link for the day three. Naputo lata si Sir Eric. Naghang yata. Naghang yata. Okay, so Sir Eric, okay, kung ano, I'll take the floor of Sir Eric. So again, for this day, we have an overload of learning. We are really so lucky to be part of this very interesting and very informative session. So I would like to express again our profound gratitude to our resource speaker, Dr. Tiglao. Thank you, sir. Our panelist, moderator, Dr. Sigwa. Also to Sir Eric, our ISG committee chair. And of course, Ma'am Proxy there for with us and uh, the members of the PIC National Board, the Secretariat, and to everyone. Now, cheers to another successful webinar sex session this day. One more to go tomorrow, and it's for uh, structural engineering. So uh, also, again, I would like to announce yung sa ongoing membership information update campaign natin. Just log in to the link provided in our PIC National Facebook account or page or at the website or you may contact your chapter officers. Just update your personal profile in our membership database so that we can serve you better. Alam nyo na, we are now going mostly online. So uh, please be counted and register online. Okay, so this is actually the project of our PIC membership committee chaired by our uh, director, Peter Paul D. Jr. No? So lastly, on behalf of the PIC National Board of Directors, uh, remember, let us always be holy, healthy, and happy. Value the learnings and the blessings of our Almighty has bestowed upon us today and every day of our lives. Keep safe always. So this is it. We are now closing our fifth day of our webinar session. But before we close our screen, please have time also to watch our PIC videos no? prepared by our publication committee, chaired by our director, Malu Olitokit, no? and uh, our sector secretariat as PIC depicts its oneness with, with everyone in fighting this COVID-19 pandemic. It goes to show that your PIC national is working despite this situation. So uh, let us always be proud to be a Filipino civil engineer. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. And again, thank you very much and God bless us all. Thank you. Thank God you. bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tiglao. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.